Anne has a very colorful CV with prestigious fellowships and awards. Uh, some of you might know her. She obtained her PhD from Harvard University in 93 and then moved ac um, across country to Pasadena, taking a, a Carnegie Fellowship for three years, then uh, just a bit up north to Santa Cruz, University of Santa Cruz, with a Hubble Fellowship, where she also spent three years to move finally uh, to Arizona with an assistant professorship since 99, and she stays until today. Um, Anne has a very broad uh, pool of interest uh, related with gal galaxy formation and cosmology. She has very nice papers on um, the structure of galaxies, uh, scaling relations and effects on, of environments. She also cares about the early universe and uses uh, cosmological lenses to try to pick up these very faint galaxies that we couldn't see otherwise in the early universe. But today she is, topic, is, is talking uh, about a different topic that is uh, also related to clusters of galaxies, but is trying to answer the question how much of the variance uh, do these systems manage to hold on to? So with that, let me call her to stage. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, it's great to be here. I know it's been a very exciting week uh, at the CFA, so I'm only talking about mundane baryons, but uh, it's, it's just great to breathe the air <laughs> in this room uh, from earlier this week. Um, I'd like to talk today, as, as was mentioned, about baryons and specifically accounting for the baryons that we see in the universe. And I wanted to start out by showing you a picture, a simple optical picture of the center of a cluster of galaxies to give you a sense of scale. This bar down here is 350 kiloparsecs. And when some of us think about clusters and galaxies, this is what we think about, a collection of thousands of, of galaxies orbiting one another. Uh, there are lots of other people in this room who think about clusters of galaxies this way. And you can see another uh, very important baryonic component of these large cluster halos, and that's the hot X-ray emitting gas. This is shown on the same scale as the first image is there. And so one of the things in doing our baryon budgeting is to make sure that we're counting up the stars that you can see on that first image and adding them to all the gas that you see on the second image. But there's another component to all this. In fact, there may be more than just one more. But it's the component that I'm going to focus a lot on today. And that's the so-called intracluster light component. This is an optical, primarily optical component uh, in clusters of galaxies. Again, this is shown on the same scale as for the other images. And you can see that in this case, if you follow out the blue contours, which don't really mean anything, this is just a surface uh, brightness map, this component of intracluster stars can extend out to omegaparsecs in clusters. And one question is, well, how important is it? Should you care about it? But these are stars that are not associated with the individual cluster members. They're stars that lie in between uh, cluster members. And one question is how they got there. Another is how important is the contribution of these stars to the baryons that have fallen into this cluster of galaxies. You can think of clusters, people think of clusters as baryon sinks. They're kind of roach motels. Once baryons check in, they do not check out. Uh, that's the thought anyway. But it's very possible that early on in their history, there might be processes, or subsequently later in their history, there might be processes that uh, cause some of those baryons, particularly gaseous baryons, to escape. And so we'd like to understand where these fit in to the constraints uh, on baryon fractions that have recently come to the fore with uh, the WMAP and Planck missions. So before I move on and, and hopefully motivate why you should care about baryons, and particularly in these overdense environments, I do want to point out uh, at the position of the Bryce Cluster Galaxies, the two people I call my brightest cluster collaborators, um, that's Anthony Gonzalez. Uh, he's a professor at the University of Florida but he was a former student who worked with me, and this is Suresh Sivanandam, also a former student, and he is now a Dunlap Fellow at University of Toronto. They have done just about all the work I'm going to present today. I'm very much their messenger. So let me move on and just describe briefly why one should bother caring about baryons in uh, intracluster stars. 
They're very hard to count. This is an incredibly low surface brightness component. As I'll show you, it's a fraction of a percent of the sky level. Uh, but as I will hopefully convince you, it is a significant component that should be counted when looking at baryons and systems. Uh, it's also a very helpful component. It turns out that these stars between galaxies are good tracers of the extended cluster potential. Uh, they come in very handy in ways that strong lensing, weak lensing measurements, uh, measurements of individual uh, planetary nebulae may fail. And I'll talk about that in a little bit because they can constrain the mass profile in the centers of galaxies, in particular within the central 100 kiloparsecs or so, where there's a big scrum over what the shape of the profile actually should be. Um, another thing to think about when considering intercluster stars is that these are stars that are already out of galaxies. So as they evolve and release metals into the cluster environment, those metals don't have to escape anything. So there's been a lot of hoops that people have attempted to jump through to understand the fairly high metal content, iron content of clusters of galaxies. And that's because you have to get metals out of galaxies to populate the inter-cluster uh, medium. But if there are stars that are already there and evolving, they could contribute perhaps significantly to the metal budget. So we'll take a look at that as well. And then the, the fourth point I want to make about baryons and clusters, and in particular baryons and intercluster stars, are that as many of you who do galaxy formation and evolution know, we're always very hard pressed to come up with a meaningful set of experiments with well-defined controls to really understand what factors may drive the evolution of galaxies. There's the nature versus nurture question, and there are relatively few unambiguous smoking guns that are possible to measure. Well, if you see a bunch of galaxies in between stars, models tend to suggest that those are stripped from the galaxies at some point during the evolution of the system. So this has the potential, this component has the potential to provide a fairly unambiguous tracer of interactions among galaxies in these environments in a way a lot of other measures do not. Let me talk for a moment about why baryons in general in clusters, because it's not just the intercluster stars that I'm going to be totaling up today. I'm going to be talking about the hot intercluster gas as well and the stars in the galaxies and speculating on anything else that might be lurking outside our ability to detect it. Uh, the gas fraction in massive halos is extremely important. Understanding how gas populates dark halos on the scales of groups and clusters of galaxies is very important, as many of you know because you're involved in these experiments, in understanding how the statistics of clusters may constrain cosmology. The dark matter density, the dark energy, depend on our ability to understand how the gas content of halos depends on the mass of the halo. A lot of SC experiments and X-ray experiments make assumptions about how the gas content scales with the mass of the halo. Another thing that we're interested in is the star formation efficiency. So I'm going to say, I'm going to define that as the fraction of gas over the fraction of stars. We're very interested in the question of how that fraction changes from one environment to another. You could well imagine that someone who does halo occupancy distribution models, someone who wants to know how to put galaxies and halos in a simulation, would be very interested in understanding the ratio of gas to stars as a function of the halo mass. If there's a lot of scatter in that term, what the shape of that trend actually looks like. And you can also imagine that as you go to more and more overdense environments, like richer clusters of galaxies, you have more hot X-ray emitting gas. That's not gas that generally is going to be effective at cooling into stars. So you get into interesting arguments about the time scales. Which comes first? Do you form stars in galaxies which migrate into clusters? Did you have hot X-ray gas there first? And what the ratio of those two components is as a function of time and as a function of halo mass is a very interesting con constraint on models of how large scale structure forms. And the other thing, I mentioned it once already, is that we're interested in testing the universal value of the baryon fraction with the environments that should hold on to the baryons that they capture, although there are various theories that suggest processes can remove some of those baryons subsequently. And we'd like to test that by adding up the baryons. <laughs> 
So uh, because a, a picture is worth a thousand words and a, a movie, even a simplistic movie, uh, can be better, I'm just going to show you for a moment a, an n-body simulation. And I want you to envision that there are luminous particles in this. I know there are far more sophisticated simulations accessible in this building, but this one kind of shows what I want you to see for the moment. So let's just use it to get some intuition. Um, what this is is the formation of a cluster of galaxies, mostly by the infall of smaller halos, most of which have masses that are equivalent to poor groups of galaxies. So we're talking about a system that might be 10 to the 15 solar masses forming from other systems that are of order 10 to the 14 solar masses or 10 to the 13 solar masses, in addition to individual galaxy halos. And as this system accretes material, the thing to keep an eye on is the process by which particles are stripped within their halos. So if you can imagine very roughly that this is a proxy for the formation of the intercluster stellar component that I was talking about earlier, you may get a feeling for when that stripping happens and how important it is on what mass scales. So you can see there are various clumps that are falling into this halo, I'll run this again, over time. But within those clumps, on very local scales, there is a lot of interaction among the halos stripping material from them. Now, that stripping should extend down into the luminous parts of the galaxies. So you could imagine that in the kinds of environments, in the smaller, lower density halos environments like groups of galaxies, that stripping might be more effective because the internal dynamics of the galaxies, their velocity dispersions are comparable to the relative motions of the galaxies. So stripping and mergers tend to be far more efficient. That may happen while or even before that subclump, that group of galaxies, falls into the cluster as a whole. So you might imagine that we'd see relatively high proportions of intracluster stars in a poor group environment compared to a rich cluster environment where we've added a lot of individual galaxies and stripping is not as effective. All right, well, let me sh actually show you some intracluster stars instead of just talking about them. Um, the way we did this project initially uh, was on a 40-inch telescope. You don't hear too much about dorky little telescopes these days, but this was the one that could. Um, it also had a very sophisticated uh, CCD uh, camera on it uh, that translated to compensate and move in great circles across the sky so we could pretty much do long drift scans in any direction of the sky that we wanted. The reason that was important is we were interested in a certain kind of cluster, which are very, very relaxed, uh, dynamically relaxed clusters with big, giant elliptical galaxies in their center. So this is the first cluster that I showed you, but now here's a longer portion of the scan. So in time, that scan would clock in this direction, averaging over the pixel-to-pixel -pixel variations, making something relatively flat, so that we really had to worry about correcting a lower level of flat fielding problems, and we had to worry about the sky. The sky's temporal variations, though, in a scan can be measured. They are on the order of about 3% in a scan like this before we started our sky subtraction processes. Um, and the sky variations at, temporally and the sky background um, can be produced uh, by um, astrophysical sources. They can be produced by the atmosphere. They can be produced by unusual illumination of the chip. So there are all sorts of things that, in particular, Anthony had to worry about when he went through these data. But I'll show you very quickly the, the process. That was the first pass at sky removal. Another big advantage to these scans was that we had a lot of the sky to deal with. So as you can see, the scans were both wide but particularly long, so we could get good measurements of the sky outside of the cluster. The smoothed image I'm going to keep on the right so you can keep an idea of where we started from. Um, but we did have to worry about the saturated stars in the image, so we had to develop uh, models of the uh, point spread function and fit the saturated stars and remove them. Um, we did that, uh, and then we actually had to continue to go over the, the image and take a look at the residual sky. Um, and illumination of the field, and that's what the model fit in this particular case looked like. 
So the large scale sky gradients got taken out and then we were left with this image. And finally, we would fit all the galaxies or mask all the galaxies in the field except for the central brightest cluster galaxy there. And that's what that looked like. And we end up, just the short version of this, going from an initial sky level of about 20 magnitudes per square arc second down to a five sigma detection at 27 and a half magnitudes per square arc second. And what that corresponds to in the surface brightness profile of these stars is several hundred kiloparsecs. And as I mentioned, sometimes out almost as far as a megaparsec. So this was the detection. We did this in about 25 systems of the intracluster starlight. Um, we fit that component in two dimensions, but I'm going to show you a one-dimensional representation of the surface brightness profile here just for visualization. This is the surface brightness profile, surface brightness versus projected radius on the sky from the center of the brightest cluster galaxy. And the first thing that you can notice is that this is not consistent with a single component. We tried various things, um, but in the end, the A2 uh, de Vogelaar component model fit this profile. And you can see the components broken down here. There's one that, whose properties are very consistent with what we know about giant elliptical galaxies, but the other is far more extended. Uh, it's about 10 times more extended than the Bryce Cluster Galaxy, and it's about 10 to 40 times brighter. Its orientation, uh, its size, its ellipticity are all consistent with that of cluster members themselves, much larger scales. So that really is this component, uh, mostly in blue, that I showed you at the beginning of the talk. Uh, and, and the FITS did a pretty good job with the ellipticity and position angle as well. Uh, and so there was really not much residual light. So this is when I'm talking about the intercluster light component. That's how we measured it. That's what we see. And it's that extended component whose baryons we are, we are looking into. When we discuss its properties, we should also mention uh, using these particles as test particles. And what you see here uh, is a Keck slit on uh, one of these systems in our sample. That's the central uh, brightest cluster galaxy. Uh, the cluster itself is, extends on much larger scales. The slit goes out to a little bit over 100 kiloparsecs. And what you see if you actually measure the velocity dispersion, the orbital temperature of the stars as you move from that central galaxy out into the cluster is something that looks like this. The velocity dispersion is at a giant elliptical level of a few hundred kilometers per second. It drops as you move out in radius from that elliptical, but then it starts rising again until it's finally matching the velocity dispersion of the cluster galaxies themselves. So this is telling you that the stars out here that are not associated with individual galaxies are responding to the potential of the cluster as a whole not the galaxy at the center. And why that is interesting is that it's just this region with regard to the predictions of Lambda CDM models that is under a bit of, of pressure because the centers of clusters of galaxies and the slope of the mass profiles um, really do depend on the simulation that's being run. People do not understand what the scatter is expected to be or halos of this scale. And so it's important that we measure it. As I'm sure you're, you know, uh, there's a bit of tension with lambda CDM from measurements of dwarf galaxies, which are also dark matter dominated systems, in that their cores tend to be softer than those predicted by, by lambda CDM. And if we actually look uh, at this system and several other systems in which we're working, um, this is the favored core from lambda CDM models. Um, and what you end up getting in the data is something that's far softer. Now, it's imaginable that baryons uh, could transfer angular momentum to the dark matter particles, in effect puffing them up. That's one of the explanations. Other people have speculated that different kinds of dark matter particles with different properties uh, could respond differently 
to what's been assumed so far in this model. But the point is there's, there's a little bit of an indication here along the lines that have been seen in dwarf galaxies, and this is an entirely different scale. So it's something on which we, we wish to reflect further, but these are useful tracers. And on a scale of 100 kiloparsecs, it's very, very hard to find other tracers in clusters of galaxies. It's really too small for, for lensing type measures. That's correct. Okay. And we've actually added points from the galaxies way out here. Right. In this case. And so yeah. would you expect that that might be biased though because the formation time in the galaxy is much earlier than the, let's say the halo potential is much less? Well, there, there are a lot of ways in, in which the, the stars could give us a dark matter profile that is not consistent with lambda CVM. There could be issues with the merger history of the object, there could be issues with anisotropy and, and various other things. But under very simple assumptions, this is not the only system in which we're seeing this. And so I think by the time we develop a statistical sample and we get more of a constraint on the scatter, it will be more interesting for models. I don't want to claim we've ruled out lambda CDM from one object, but it is interesting on such different scales that we're seeing similar behavior. The dwarf galaxies, it's probably not the same process. Um, a bunch of absorption lines, but magnesium, iron. Um, so I did also mention um, that these are stars, the intercluster stars, that don't have to do very much to up the metal content of the intercluster environment. And uh, typically, the, the iron content is about 0.3 solar. Uh, that's very rough average in rich clusters of galaxies. Uh, and it's been very hard to come up with models to generate that level of iron just from getting metals out of the galaxies that we know are there. So the question is, what happens if we factor in the metals that the evolving intercluster stars are likely to produce? Uh, once again, we've got an optical image. and an x-ray image, I know, to warm the cockles of many of your hearts. I just wanted to get them both in there. But the point is, this has got a lot of metals. Where does it come from? It can't just come from the galaxies we can see. It's hard. So um, one idea is just let's make a consistency argument. Uh, we can evolve an old population of stars, assume that's our intercluster light, to the luminosity of that intercluster light component. That we can turn into a stellar mass for that component. If we have the, the total stellar mass and we have the star formation history, then we know with certain assumptions what, how many supernovae got made, what their yield was, and therefore how much iron they produced at each redshift. We can integrate over all those redshifts and make a prediction for how much iron could have been produced in the supernovae arising from the evolution of the population of intercluster stars. What happens when we do that? Um, let me just show you three panels here. Uh, each panel is a plot of the predicted amount of iron from this simple test over what is observed. So the target is one. And we are plotting this as a function of the velocity dispersion of the system. Uh, and what's shown at the top are the contributions we estimate could be from the intercluster stars alone as a function of the velocity dispersion of the different systems in which we tested this. What I'm showing you in the middle is what could come from the galaxies themselves under different assumptions about how many metals they could lose. And what we see on the bottom is the total. So the point that I wanted to make here is that on average, it's not hard to get 30% of the iron that's been measured within R500 from the intercluster stars. And that's good because you can't get it all from the galaxies themselves. Uh, even if the galaxies have 85% metal loss, which is consistent with the metals that are not retained by the stars in the galaxies. And if you combine these, you can get all the iron that is observed in these systems on average. So it's a simple point, but you, you, need, these, you need these stars. So let me just summarize what, what I hope we've learned so far, and that is the intercluster stars are a distinct component. They are a ubiquitous component. We see them in every system in which we've looked. We've looked about 25 
Uh, they are significant in that their contribution to the total stellar budget, depending on what type of halo you're talking about, can range anywhere from 20% to 80%. Their contribution tends to be a lot higher, and I'll show you this in a moment, for lower mass halos than for higher mass cluster-like halos. Um, it's cluster-like in size, orientation, and ellipticity. It responds to the cluster potential um, in a way that's very intriguing uh, that we need to reflect further upon. And it is an important contributor. It's not the sole contributor, but it's an important contributor. It makes up the difference with regard to the enrichment of the intercluster medium. All right, well, let me show you the money plot, which I've been working towards. You're going to have to take it on faith that we analyzed uh, the x-ray data. This comes from XMM um, very, very carefully. Uh, over a long period of time. Uh, and I will show you um, the trends of stellar and gas fractions as a function of the halo masses that we're talking about. So let's just focus on the top panel for a second. What you see on the left is the baryon fraction. This is all within R500, so it's uniform for the entire sample. Uh, versus the total mass of the system within R500. So we're going from sort of intermediate groups of galaxies up through very rich clusters of galaxies. And what you see on the top in red is what the gas fraction is doing. This is just the hot X-ray emitting gas. And what you see in the blue points going down is the total stellar baryon fraction. That includes stars in and out of galaxies. And what's pretty interesting is that they go in opposite directions. Um, and they go in opposite directions um, in a way that uh, is, is somewhat of a problem for simulations at the moment in that it's very, very difficult uh, for simulations to come up with a stellar trend that looks like this. This is, this is too steep. Another thing I should point out is that the gas fraction is not constant with the halo mass. It does rise. This is the kind of thing that needs to be taken into account in assuming the mass of halos in X-ray constraints, SE constraints on cosmology. So what happens when we combine these two trends? We get what you see at the bottom here. Um, and there are a lot of interesting things in this plot. There are not all that many points yet. We're adding to it, but it's, it's painstaking work. What you can see, though, is that the range of baryon fractions, and this is total now, not assuming anything more than the components that I've showed you, um, can get pretty close to the W map value. This is W map. They're actually even closer if we use the Planck numbers. I have that too if you're interested. Uh, but basically, on sort of the right side of the plot, we get to within, on average, about 80% of the universal value. Uh, you know, 10 or 20%, given the system X here, does not keep me up at night. Uh, <laughs> um, but it is, you do have a little bit of wiggle room if you believe in a, a warm component or, or that um, things would change if we extended to a, a larger radius, for example. Uh, but as you look down to the left on this plot, uh, the scatter starts to exceed the errors. Again, not too many data points yet, but it is quite intriguing because it kind of suggests that by the time you get to Virgo scale systems and below, uh, there is a range, a physically interesting range in the total baryon fractions. And the question is why that is. Uh, is it initial conditions? Do you have something that does produce a deficit in some of the baryons at some point in the history of the object? Or are we just misestimating some of the observational quantities I showed you? That's always a possibility. All right. I mentioned star formation efficiency. This has bearing on the previous plot, but it's interesting in its own right. Let's plot star mass over gas mass, again, as a function of the total mass of the halo. Um, we plot it in red points without the intercluster stars and blue points with the intercluster stars. You can get some sense that the intercluster stars matter more as you go to low masses. I'll show you that more clearly in a moment. But the main thing that I wanted to point out here is the scatter on this plot is within the observational areas. It's actually much tighter statistically than the total baryon fraction plot. So very roughly, that's suggesting to us that the gas and the stars at a given mass are affected similarly. And that suggests that at later times, you're not redistributing baryons in these systems. You're not blowing a bunch 
of, of gas out um, at, to larger radii, for example, because you would change the star formation efficiency scatter if that were the case. So this is suggesting that, that if baryons get lost, if that was the explanation of the scatter in the previous plot that I showed you, well, they, they better get, get lost um, at, at very, very early times, perhaps before they've had a chance to form stars, else it's going to be very hard uh, to keep the scatter as tight as it's observed here. So that, that's interesting. It, it's suggesting that, and, and it was kind of puzzling, uh, it still is, to me, we would have expected perhaps that the star formation efficiency, your ability to turn gas and stars in a halo of a given mass, would actually be the variable thing. And the total baryon fractions, you know, all the baryons, regardless of their phase that you put in a halo, would be the tight thing. That's the opposite of what we're seeing. Absolutely, and I, I, think, I think that's where it's going to be a very interesting constraint on, on simulations, yeah. Um, I also mentioned this issue of tidal stripping. I showed you that movie and waved my hands a little bit at the beginning of the talk. Um, and I tried to tee it up a little bit <laughs> for you by saying that, gee whiz, look, you know, interactions between galaxies, stripping of tidal material happens in little nuggets and poor groups, and then they fall into clusters, and maybe it stalls because clusters are hotter, things are moving faster, stripping efficiencies, mergers efficiencies go down. Um, well, that's the kind of thing that we see. Uh, if you take a look now just in the stellar component, if you break up the stars into intercluster light fraction, uh, the total fraction of stars. Um, what you see as you go from low mass halos to high mass halos, here's plotted versus velocity dispersion, is a trend downward. And what this suggests is that the intercluster light, as I mentioned, is a lot more important to the stellar baryon budget in poor groups than it is in, in rich clusters. And that's because the contribution of the ICL to clusters, even though there's more ICL in clusters, rises more slowly than the contribution of galactic stars. So individual galaxies are falling into clusters and they're not being stripped much. And they're diluting this fraction. Okay, so what, what do we know so far? Um, there are not that many missing baryons. I said we're within spitting distance of the WMAP and, and Planck results within 10, 20 percent. A lot of the time, even at the low mass end, there are still groups of galaxies that have more or less the universal value. There's not that much room for missing baryonic components. Um, we see steeply declining stars. That's potentially a problem for simulations. Rising gas uh, with halo mass. And the star formation efficiency declines with mass, but it's a fairly tight relation, especially compared to how the total baryon fraction changes with mass. So it's kind of hard to imagine scenarios in which, and there are many of them proposed, in which gas uh, leaves the system later um, because it's hard to get both gas and stars out in equal proportion. Um, and stripping seems to be less efficient at higher masses as we would have anticipated, but I, again, this harkens back to my claim that we've got a signature here of tidal interactions. And it's a fairly unambiguous one, and we're seeing an effective environment. What don't we know yet? Um, well, we'd really like to shore up. Those were not many data points. So we'd like more, uh, particularly at lower mass, where things seem to be getting more exciting. Um, and we'd like to understand the redshift evolution. I showed you a movie that was in time. We would like to have more than a snapshot of the local universe. So what are we doing about that? Uh, well, we, as many do, go to uh, X-ray and optical telescopes in space. Um, I always try to block this off. Anybody know what cluster this is? <laughs> I guess you can read through my hand. Okay. <laughs> um, well, it's, it's one of everyone's favorite clusters. Uh, we are not using it to prove the existence of dark matter. We are using it to sample the intercluster uh, stellar light population. Uh, but you can begin to get a sense here of just how good HST may be for this kind of project. There are disadvantages. Uh, this is not a very big field. So finding places from which to measure the sky uh, is more of a challenge. But of course, it's a lot deeper. We don't have atmospheric sky or temporal sky fluctuations to, to deal with. 
Um, and flat fields, of course, is a subject of intense scrutiny uh, at STSCI, and there's been a lot of, of work done on, on flat fielding these images well. Another advantage is um, we're looking in the infrared at these redshifts. Now we're talking about redshifts of 0 0.3, 0 0.5. That really ups the contrast, because this is mostly an old stellar population. Uh, of, of this very low surface brightness component. So um, just to step through this, give you a sense of what happens as we go deeper and deeper in isophotes here, as shown on the lower right, you get a sense of how we really bring up that component. Um, and we're doing this for quite a few systems now. Um, here's a, a system in the CLASH survey, ABEL 2261. I'll give you a sense of what happens when we mask out the obvious galaxies and uh, change the scaling brightness, you can really see the extent of this intercluster light component. I like doing this. These are pretty, so I'll show you a few more. Um, here's Max uh, J2129. These are really magnificent clusters at intermediate redshifts that are being used for gravitational lensing surveys, for various other things. Um, but once again, just to give you a sense of how far out um, and significant uh, this component uh, may, in fact, turn out to be, even at intermediate redshifts. Of course, we're, we're interested in understanding um, whether or not there's a change. If we can measurably see the contribution of this population change, if you think back to that model, the simulation that I showed you, the change may not be here. The change may be in poor groups of galaxies. The change may be in subclumps in these very messy systems. So that's where we're, we're looking. Uh, but overall, if we actually look at the surface brightness profiles and the color gradients don't look much different than this, they're pretty smooth. And they're pretty similar uh, for the first set of, of objects that we're looking at. So on the surface of it, this, and this is an entirely qualitative statement that will mean a lot more when compared to models, uh, there's not much evidence there's been evolution at least up to a redshift of a half or so in general, averaged over the, the whole system. Um, now, I haven't talked much about where this, this population could be coming from. And uh, there's a student at Florida, Talia De Matteo, uh, whose picture I should have showed you at the beginning of the talk. Uh, who's working very, very hard on this sample. And she's been trying to analyze the colors uh, of and the color gradients of this intercluster stellar population from the Hubble Space Telescope data uh, to understand whether or not uh, these, what types of galaxies these stars could have been stripped from and if that makes sense physically. And so uh, just to, to give you an idea, of uh, the kinds of ways we've been thinking about this. Uh, this is the color gradient of the bullet cluster, but the radius axis is arbitrary here. Don't worry about that. You'll see why I don't care in a minute. But I just wanted to give you a feeling of the range of colors that we're seeing as we step out in radius from the center of this cluster through this intercluster stellar population. And we'll see in a moment what that corresponds to. Let's superimpose on this for a moment the color magnitude diagram of cluster members in the bullet cluster. So again, for the red curve, it has an arbitrary radial scaling. I'm really very interested, though, in the range of colors compared to the red sequence of cluster members in the color magnitude diagram, which you can see here. The blue points are spectroscopically confirmed cluster members so far. And what's interesting about this, I mean, we, we did not have flexibility vertically in this plot, um, is that the color gradient of the intracluster light tracks very well, can track very well the range of colors on the red sequence. So it suggests that far out from, you know, hundreds of kiloparsecs from the center of the system where we see that light blue in. It's bluening because either it's sampling galaxies with the metallicities of these blue dwarf, bluer red sequence dwarfs, or we're dealing with material and or 
we're dealing with materials stripped from the outskirts of L-star galaxies, which basically have this color as well. And it turns out, Talia did the calculation, looked at simulations, there aren't enough dwarfs to make up the light content that we see at large radii. So at this point, a preliminary work, we're leaning towards arguing that we're really seeing mostly the stripped outer parts of, of L-star galaxies. And yes, oh, thank you. Um, and just to get, give you an understanding, I mean, it's really possible to start with some assumptions about the stellar populations, putting constraints on the metallicity profiles as well. All right, well, I, I mentioned one of the things that we're starting to look at, focus on, is the idea of, well, what would we expect over time? Which environments do we expect to see the stripping going on? Poor group environments, lower mass systems than what I was just showing you in the bullet cluster, maybe some of the components, the smaller components of the bullet cluster, but here's stuff we just got um, on two low mass groups that we're studying. And you can get the sense, again, very qualitatively looking at this, that these are train wrecks. You can see at this very high stretch that there is structure in the intercluster light. It is not that very smooth two-dimensional looking thing that I showed you earlier in the bullet cluster. So this is intriguing. We may be seeing uh, the origin of some of the stuff in these systems. We may be seeing this unambiguous signature of galaxy interactions, um, changing galaxies, stripping material from them, enriching their environments as they build up uh, systems into clusters. All right, so let me just go back to the uh, motivational slides. <laughs> I sound like a motivational speaker. The <laughs> motivating slides that I, uh, I gave you at the beginning of the talk um, and go through some of the things that I mentioned were important, uh, at least to me, uh, hopefully now more to you. Um, and that was we, we asked if the intercluster stars were a significant component of the, the stellar barium budget and even the overall barium budget? And the answer to that is yes, uh, we need to account for them. Makes a, a big difference in the stellar fraction trends, makes a big difference in the metals, makes a big difference in the total barium fraction. If you don't have them, you get different trends. Um, I mentioned that they could be very useful of the uh, potential of the system and that they were tracers in that important core region of the cluster and provided potentially the opportunity to say whether or not we've got a problem with the dark matter particle, more likely we have a problem with what we're assuming about the interaction between baryons and dark matter. Um, and what we found was that uh, the core was softer, like in dwarf galaxies, uh, but we're not sure why, nor are we sure what the scatter is. Maybe this was an unusual system. The few others we've looked at, do not suggest that, but uh, we're going to keep going on this and hopefully be able to tell the simulators what the scatter should be as a target uh, for simulations. And the question is whether or not they enrich, enrich intercluster gas. They do. You need them to make up the metal budget that we see in hot X-ray emitting gas in clusters. And uh, we do have a sense that stripping becomes less efficient as we go to higher mass halos. And in particular, the colors are suggesting that we're stripping from the outer parts of L-star galaxies. And at some point, the effectiveness of that stripping stalls. We reach some saturation point where intercluster light does not continue to accumulate at the same rate it did in the more interactive environment. And at some point, we're just adding individual galaxies and diluting the ratio between intercluster stars and stars and galaxies. But there's an indication that we might be able to see the action in poor groups of galaxies and maybe even in subunits and clusters if we look hard enough. Um, I also mentioned that we're interested in understanding how baryons occupy halos for a variety of reasons. So what about the gas phase? That's an important constraint. Uh, ultimately on cosmological models using cluster statistics and we did measure that trend, and it is a trend. Uh, it's not constant, so that's the kind of thing we have to worry a little bit about, including the scatter in that relation. Um, 
we talked about star formation efficiency and how stars get into halos, how galaxies have to be put into halos because you've converted gas into stars. Um, that's interesting. It's tighter than the total baryon fraction relation. It declines with mass. Um, and that's, that's something that we really need to understand, although at some level it's nice that there's not that much scatter in it. Simulators might be somewhat emboldened by the fact that it's somehow fairly stable for a given hair mass. And we find that baryon fraction is kind of sort of more or less, for some cases, consistent with the universal fraction in that anywhere from 5 times 10 to the 13 solar masses up through uh, 2 times 10 to the 15 solar masses, there are systems with the universal value. Um, but that as we go to lower cluster halo masses, the scatter in that quantity increases, the deficit relative to the universal increases, and we think that's a physical effect that cannot be due to a late time redistribution of baryons. So with that, I will conclude my talk and thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so, my question is about the efficiency of tail stripping. The tracers that we know so far are UCDs and compact ellipticals. And while we know dozens, I'd say hundreds of UCDs and clusters, we know only a handful in groups, all the people searched for them intensively. And the same applies to compact ellipticals. If you look at the local volume, well, the local universe, you have a few in the Virgo cluster, uh, one in NGC 5846, which is almost a cluster, and only M32 is in a poor group. Mm -hmm. So how does it relate to what you've shown about the stripping efficiency that, you know, you would expect to see more of them in the groups than in clusters? I, well, are you, are, is your premise that they form while stripping is going on? I guess I mean, I like this one this, of those these are the remnants, the, the remnants of the uh, stripped galaxies, like, you know, the uh, Strict nuclei or strict bulges. Yeah, I, I mean, again, I, I, I don't, I don't know. Um, they may be. Um, they can certainly form. I think in tidal interactions. I'm not sure if they're, that's their dominant mode of formation. We should talk about it. If you uh, know otherwise, I'd like to hear it. Um, but I, I certainly think that there are numerous examples in uh, poor groups of galaxies where we do see galaxy interactions and tidal encounters going on. So that part isn't a figment of my imagination. And I think we also see numerous examples in uh, relatively poor groups of galaxies where the properties of the galaxies are in fact very similar to what we see in rich clusters as if there has not been a dramatic transition between the poor group environment and the richer cluster environment. I'll give you some examples. So the dwarf degeneration, and I'm not talking about your kinds of dwarfs, I'm, I'm talking about normal. things that might be, yeah, normal dwarfs, <laughs> you know, things that, that might be um, M star plus four or, or, or something like that. The dwarf to giant ratio in, in across the mass range that I was showing you here is actually constant. And, and that's very interesting. If you look at the morphology fraction, that's more or less constant. So you have, there are four groups, and particularly these very relaxed ones with these brightest uh, group galaxies, giant ellipticals in them, where you see comparable ratios of early to late type galaxies as you do in the richest clusters. Um, there are various examples like that. We see similar fractions of post-starburst galaxies, uh, where it, it does seem to me that what's going, a lot of what's driving those changes anyway in the galaxies is happening very locally in these potential, you know, tidal interactions, mergers, in the environments where those things can happen. And then it's stalling when, you, when they fall into an environment where they reach hydrostatic equilibrium at much faster speeds. So I'd love to talk to you further about what you're saying. I think it's an interesting test. Um, one beside Ben and Isn't there another player in this region, which is uh, Lyman Alpha absorption clouds? Mm -hmm. That means that any sight line through here to a distant quasar will show 
a couple of dozen of clouds associated with this cluster. Mm -hmm. And so wouldn't they fit into the baryon budget and possibly be scattering light? Yes, so I, I think one, one thing I, I can tell you is that undoubtedly there are components and wavelengths that we have not searched or using techniques we've not yet searched. And there have been many claims of O6 absorption detections and things in the halos of, of groups and, and clusters of galaxies. So there are additional components. I mean, we have, I didn't talk to, about H1 today or, or any of those things. Um, I guess my, my point is that I don't think those contribute at more than a 10 or 20 percent level uh, in clusters. And for some uh, groups, they might contribute more. But it's interesting that at, even at that low mass range, there are still systems that are consistent with the richer clusters. So if, if there were a component um, that just was more and more of a factor in lower and lower mass systems, um, we'd see a lot more of a trend in the total barrier question than I think we're observing at this point. The question is about environment um, and time scale when it comes to star formation and turning stars into gas. If I understand you correctly, when you say star formation efficiency, you're basically just saying how, much, how many stars and how much My star formation efficiency is not your star I know. <laughs> <laughs> but importantly, this, is, this is very simplistic, but, but yes. <laughs> the, the time scale for forming stars is measured in millions of years, and the time scale for these interactions is measured in many, many, many millions to billions of years, yeah? So some of these stars then are not forming in the galaxies. They're forming in these weird environments as things are being tidally stripped, right? And that environment is very different than the environment in the galaxy. And so you would not necessarily expect the same ratio of stars to gas. And so in other words, saying how many stars do we see and how much gas do we see as a star formation efficiency seems kind of dangerous. Yes, and, and, and maybe it, it deserves a change in title to the well, no, because proportion this, of one phase right. to another. Instead of maybe linking it in a causal way, as I, in effect, have done, I should merely say, here's the ratio of stars to gas that we have in these systems. Here is how it varies with halo. And then on much smaller scales, you might be able to infer what that means. In well, terms make of the it. simulators form the stars. Yeah, make, make the simulators form yes. <laughs> Are you listening? <laughs> I don't know if I missed this, but what's the actual ratio of stars in and out of galaxies, and how does that vary across the course? Yeah, so um, in this sample, uh, the proportion, in fact, let me go back and you can see that figure. It's easier than my waving my hands. I hope it wasn't too far back. But we, we I mean, we're, we're talking on average, sorry, it can be 40%. Um, uh, almost there. Here we go. So it can be 80% to 20%, on average 40%, which is pretty steep. Other questions? Got one way up on top. Oh, oh uh, the Phoenix Gallery. <laughs> does that ratio match the sort of hostless supernova fraction? Yes, yeah, so it, it does actually. I mean, they're not that many hostless supernovae, um, but uh, Danny Mals has made some measurements. Uh, Dave Sand has made some measurements, and um, actually, the the fraction of of, of intracluster supernovae are what you would predict from the content of of stars that we see. Uh, between galaxies, and also they're more or less consistent with our very simplistic stellar evolution model when we were trying to generate the metallicity budget. All right, so if there are no more questions, uh, we are taking Anne for dinner tonight. So we are going at 6.30. There are a couple of places left if you want to join. Just come and talk to me. Now let us um, uh, thank Anne again for a lovely collection. Thank you.